Welcome to the Alternative Investment Podcast. I am your host, Andy Hagens. And today we're talking about a really important issue uh, for our society at large and also, quite frankly, a very appealing investment thesis, investment sector. We're talking about workforce housing. And, and honestly, DJ, with all of the sectors, when I talk to families, when I talk to RIAs, high net worth investors, again and again, workforce housing, obviously multifamily, obviously industrial, but like this is the one that it's people can't get enough of. And it's funny because that's on the investment side, but also just in the general market, we literally can't make enough workforce housing. So anyway, joining me today, DJ, I'll introduce you. You are the founder of the Van Curen Family Office Real Estate Institute, as well as a co-managing member of Evergreen Property Partners. And, and DJ, to tie it in here, um, a lot of our viewers and listeners already know about the Institute, but could you tell us more about Evergreen Property Partners and how family offices and private wealth, how that all ties into workforce housing? Sure. So, um, you know, although I've had 25 years of, of experience in real estate, last seven years started working um, in the family office sector, worked for uh, initially for a billionaire that was a patriarch on his real estate portfolio. Uh, then I got headhunted from the Heyman family, Giorgio Perfume, Giorgio Beverly Hills, came up with a boutique office brand strategy, you know, worked as an employee on, on his portfolio. And then um, I had always been asked by families to help them with their real estate investing and was, weren't, wasn't really able to do that because I had been you know, working for a specific family. So mm -hmm. uh, I brought in a partner and we started Evergreen Property Partners. It's a um, family office real estate consortium. And we're really there to help maintain uh, a legacy and to... Um, you know, allow monies to be passed through future generations because families have a big problem. And that 70% lose their wealth by the second gen, 90% by the third gen. And so we take a look at it in a holistic approach at the real estate markets and where are their opportunities, right? Um, and a lot of people, you know, have been, especially families, um, have been investing into the multifamily sector for, for quite some time now. And workforce housing um, does come up and it is of great interest. Uh, and that's because it covers a two different areas. One is that, you know, there's the investors that say, well, I'm, I'm helping a, a problem that we have, right? Mm -hmm. And a part of the economy um, and people that have this need, but also because there's such a demand for this product type, um, that means that, uh, you know, you have some favorable returns um, from your investment as well. You know, it's interesting with family offices. I mean, honestly, institutionals, family offices, ultra high net worth investors, and we've seen this in the opportunity zone world, they're all interested in making an impact, right? And they don't necessarily segment that out from their investment in the way that, you know, maybe people did decades ago. It's all kind of one thing, one mindset now. And I think it's very rare where the stars sort of align, where, you know, an investor can invest in something that is so sorely needed by our society so that it creates so much value for our society at large, but that also just frankly, the market dynamics is there's such an undersupply of workforce housing as a resource that it's a very uh, appealing investment opportunity. But let's start with what is workforce housing, DJ? Yeah. So, you know, workforce housing is everywhere, right? They're especially in urban areas, other employment centers, um, but when you look at some of the characteristics of what workforce properties are, it's affordable to renters with lower incomes. Uh, some people call it, you know, blue collar workers. You, you, you have um, people such as police officers, firefighters, teachers, uh, healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. um, dental assistants, uh, and service workers. That could be retail clerks, or it could be managers of, let's say, fast food places. Right. So this is a segment of, of the market where um, 
you're you're the people that are day to day really out there working um are are need a place to live right and this all goes hand in hand with uh, many states and the conversation about having, you know, raising the minimum wage mm -hmm. because a, a lot of renters are just, um, you know, cost burden. They're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's as a whole. Well, then you take into consideration the lower income households and that percentage is much, much higher, right. For, mm -hmm. for what they're needing to put it toward. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it could be as much as 60 to, you know, 120% of the area median income. And so you, you've, it's, it's an area that um, some people are just priced out of, right? Now, right. this is not subsidized renters like Section 8. A lot of people think that there's government subsidies that are helping pay for, um, for workforce housing. But that's not the real definition. It, the real definition is literally from the workforce perspective, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of those subsidized aren't necessarily working. Um, and so they're, or if they're working, it's very, very little. These people are working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, sometimes multiple jobs, uh, have a family. And that's that's what we're talking about. That That is the category really of, uh, you know, workforce housing. So workforce housing, we are talking about truly middle-class housing and in urban areas like yeah. MSAs like New York City or Chicago. Well, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not middle-class, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you, if you look at and you have, so in real estate, there's four different quadrants that people are considered, right? So A, in an A area, that's where you're going to have your very high income earners, right? Mm -hmm. The houses that cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. Sure. You then have B markets, which are really your white collar workers, mm -hmm. right? Um, professionals. In the C, that's really where your workforce housing falls in. Sure. And um, and then your D is the, uh, sometimes people classify it as, as, you know, not the most desirable area to live, right? Well, and a lot of, a lot of housing you know, low income housing is going to be government subsidized. It's going to be, yes. look, it's going to be looked at a little bit differently and workforce housing in my mind, at least it's, it's almost like it's in the gap because obviously with like mass affluent or, you know, class a affordable luxury, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of private money that's developing that kind of housing nationwide and, you know, all kinds of localities and then also, you know, you have Section 8 and you have public housing, but there's this gap where there's an underdevelopment of affordable housing that's, you know, that's in the private market. And so, you know, I say middle class, you know, maybe working class is, is a better uh, term, but you're, you're talking about firefighters, police officers, teachers in cities like Chicago or L.A. or New York City. Um, you know, and the question is, can they even afford to live in the very cities in which they work? And so that's that's workforce housing, right? Yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting because I, I lived on the Upper West Side for about seven years in New York City. And often the police officers that were downtown had to live outside the city. Now, mm -hmm. at the time, Brooklyn wasn't being gentrified, right? So they might live out there. They might live um, in parts of Harlem. Um, which is still on the island, but the, you know, it's still extremely affordable. But usually, it's outside of the city because they just couldn't. You know, there's a gap in what they can actually afford. You know, and and one of the things that also happens is, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But what um, rent subsidized or um, you know rent control does to cities as well, because it has a huge impact because there's a lot of cities and, and municipalities that are trying to help solve this problem, you know, and what happened, if we look back historically from this is that the affordable housing landscape um, started because of the, the need for this workforce housing uh, emerged, right? So right. from the 1940s to the 90s, 
housing was affordable to many middle income workers, right? The, the wages were relatively correlated with the cost of living. And at that time, too, ownership actually became affordable through the introduction of the 30-year mortgage loan. Mm -hmm. However, what happened during the late 90s and early 2000s is that income began to lag behind the rising cost of living, right? And the housing supply for middle-income workers grew stagnant. And uh, so this um, created a huge need for workforce housing, especially in these larger metropolitan areas, just like you said, in the city, Chicago, New York, right? And then you get into the great recession that we had of 2007 to 2009. And this just increased the issue of this housing affordability for middle-income workers, right? And um, uh, also with the reduction of the production of new housing units across the nation, you know, it was, um, it just exacerbated, you know, the problem. And if we move forward a little bit more, when, um, you know, renters uh, have seen, you know, prices surge mm -hmm. in many markets. I mean, a lot of these markets, we just keep seeing the cost of these houses, the price. I mean, I live in Denver and how much my house has appreciated alone in the last seven years is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really doesn't make sense, but it continues to to grow and, and the supply is limited. Um, and of course, then you have the, you know, the coronavirus and everything else. And so about half of Americans, so let's say 49%, they say actually that the uh, availability of affordable housing in their local community is a major problem. And that's up 10 percentage points from 2018. I mean, it, it's an issue that we have here in the U.S. that really, really needs a solution. And um, that's one of the reasons why investors see this. They know that, mm -hmm. right? We're working on a project right now that we've identified down in the Houston area and we're going to, it's actually, uh, they're modular for rent communities that are being developed with, with our partner. And nationally, there's a 7 million gap of affordable units that are needed. In Houston alone, it's 200,000, right, for this, for this target market. And out of our, you know, 10 communities, we're only going to fill a 1% gap. And that's developing these communities over the next seven years. So if we're only able to take a 1% gap, what is that demand there, right? And with demand provides, um, you know, like on our pilot program, there's a, there's a waiting list, actually a paid waiting list, right? That's unheard of for the most part. And so with that, it provides an opportunity, you know, to do good, to help out, uh, but also pretty, pretty, seasonable returns, sizable returns for investors, which is goes back to why there's such an interest hitting both sides of those coins. So it's continuing to be a, an issue. So this development in Houston, this is in partnership with Evergreen Property Partners? Yeah, exactly. So like you had mentioned before, I mean, we there is a demand that are there. 70% of families invest in the multifamily and there's the different classifications based upon what I mentioned earlier of, you know, A, which is your premium multifamily rentals down to, uh, you know, white collar to working force. And, and but there's a gap because um, a lot of these workers uh, can't afford some of those other, Properties, so yeah, that's exactly what we're doing with Evergreen on one of our projects. is is really focused on that workforce housing area. Yeah, and it's interesting because you look at the history of workforce housing and the housing shortage in the you know the Great Recession, two thousand eight development of well all types of housing, but especially in this sector, it really cratered, and it has never recovered. So so not only is there was there this gap. But the gap actually continues to widen in terms of the amount of workforce housing that's being created and the demand. And so, I mean, to me, that says we're not just looking at market forces. We're also looking at public policy and, mm -hmm. you know, political decisions and policy decisions that affect this. So, DJ, let's go there next. Um, 
you know, how is workforce housing viewed politically? I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I, I would think that in, in any MSA, you know, it, it would be a good thing to incentivize private capital, right, to invest in and create workforce housing, but the devil's in the details, right? Yeah. And and there's been there's been a lot of um people that have tried to to really help with this issue, right? Mm-hmm. And this has been over the years. So one of the things that uh was tried by the government was to have a public private type development. So they would say, okay, we're going to build out of your 200 units that you're going to build, uh, let's say 50 of them are for a certain income level. Mm -hmm. Well, from a developer, that's great for those people. But from a developer perspective, um, that hurts your returns, right? So then you don't necessarily have that incentive for a lot of developers to build those. And then there's also been, you know, rent control. Well, when I lived in New York, you know, I'm paying $4,700 for 11 square foot apartment. And yet somebody downstairs, and this is number of people within the building are paying like a thousand dollars a month and their increase is 3% a year. So you can imagine that it takes a long time for that to get up. So what does the owner do? The owner says, I have to make up the difference in these people that aren't paying higher amounts. So if that whole building was the same, maybe our rent's only $3,000, but because they have to make it up of these other people. So the um, that really drives rent up for um, the cities and it goes back to why those police officers can't live in this city because those rents are so high. Well, San Francisco or California in general have talked about rent control, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that this is exactly what's going to happen uh, because of that. But politically, I mean, since 2018, um, there's been increases in demographic groups who who say, you know, that this affordable housing in their community is a major problem. Mm-hmm. So, for example, 55 percent of the adults under 30 say, yeah, this is a, a, a big issue. Um, and that was a 16 percentage point rise from the 39 percent that it was in 2018. So just you know, a little bit later, and that shares with adults between 30 to 49 who hold this view has also risen from 42% in 2018 to 55% last year. Well, and, that tracks and, with uh, that tracks with asset prices <laughs> because you also saw home prices just shoot up tremendously over the past 18 months. Yeah, and and you know, one of the things just like that has happened uh, in the family office space is the first gens if they could have the ability to inv- get a 16% return and, and save the, save the world mm-hmm. compared to saving the world and getting a 13% return, um, they would take the 16. It's the younger generations that are more concerned about, um, you know, they're being uh, about what's happened to our environment, right. Mm-hmm. Or other people, et cetera. Now, a lot of those are a lot of the younger generation are Democrats. Right. Mm -hmm. And about six in 10 Democrats and independents. Right. Who lean to the Democratic Party. Um, And this is 59 percent of that said in 2021 that affordable housing is a major problem in the community compared to Republicans who said 36 percent of these Republicans said that there's an issue. Right. So it sort of goes back between the, you know, what I said with the younger and the older generations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it falls in the, in the, um, you know, the political area as well. And everybody knows that there's an issue. Um, it's just a matter of how do you really tackle that? And, you know, that one of the biggest issues, uh, the problems is, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but is, The zoning, one of the reasons why we're doing the project and we're so excited in Houston about it is because they don't have zoning laws. Right. So you can build, you know, you can, you can build a hotel right next to a multifamily or industrial building. I mean, you you can, you can't do that because of zoning laws in other parts of the country. Right. So that allows to really develop these type of communities um, because you know, mobile home parks have been doing extremely well over the years. A lot of investors like those, right? For the cash flow and everything. But you can't just go out and put a put a, a mobile home park anywhere. Mm-hmm. There has to be certain uh, zoning 
that will allow it. And, you know, because a lot of people can say, well, mobile home park, that's there's a solution to help because it's less expensive. But, you know, uh, it, it's you can't just do it everywhere. But there are some strategies, um, you know, well, that and, 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 and DJ, taken. yeah, I, I think it's interesting because one thing you said that I just want to repeat, everyone agrees that there's a problem. Mm-hmm. It's just a question of of what the solution is. And we see, you know, you talked about you know, different party affiliations. And, and so every, you know, seems like most people agree there's a problem, or at least a lot of people do, especially in the younger generations, but then the solutions might differ wildly, right? Like on the one hand, you might have some people think the solution would be rent control or other policies. And then on the other side, they'd say, well, th- that might actually be counterproductive, make the problem worse by disincentivizing the development of workforce housing. And I just wanted to take a moment, you know, to recognize the Opportunity Zones program, which I thought mm-hmm. was, you know, obviously we have Opportunity DB is, is a partner site with Alts DB, so we're very involved there, and it's a bipartisan program that's incentivizing private capital to invest in, um, you know, these these uh, economically distressed census tracts, and so you know it, there, maybe there's been a few aspects that have been controversial, but on the whole. That program has been very, very successful. And t- to me, it's like there's this almost like sleeping sleeping giant of private capital that I think is is willing to invest in in the development of workforce housing. You know, if, if only it will be approved, if it will be zoned, if it will be allowed. And so, you know, the the development that you're talking about in Houston, that's very exciting. And, you know, I, I understand, you know, Texas, a lot of these places in the Sun Belt. They're just a lot more friendly to developers, right? Well, a hundred percent. And you know, when you look at the opportunity zones and what they came out with, and you know, your partner site does an excellent job um, in providing information on that and talking to various developers and really getting good insight. Um, but that was one of the ways to combat this issue, right? That was that was one of the the reasons why they implemented to say, okay. Let's go into these markets or, or these areas that they identified um, that they can help regentrify or provide certain services or housing right in these areas. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to offer tax benefits, which was actually quite smart, right? Mm-hmm. And um, usually, what happens anytime you go into a, an area it starts to get gentrified, well, additional things happen. And it grows that community, you know, and it, and it just starts, uh, you know, it, it just continues on. Right? Amenities so like and sushi restaurants and, <laughs> you know, the, the good, good and bad. But you're talking about essentially, um, you know, citizens, businesses entering into an area that is economically distressed and, and enhancing the area from that livability point of view. Yeah, and and you know the thing the one of the problems, um, even in some of these opportunity zone areas, right, is that it's become increasingly difficult for these workers, um, you know, to buy or rent in the area that they work. Just like we said, and this is part due to their wages. And now we have the rise in gas, which is significantly more, but they're having to push outside in order to find these places, right? In order to live. And, um, you know, so so that's where when you take an opportunity zone, for example, even though it might be outside of, um, uh, of an area, uh, like some of the opportunity zones, they're creating that live, work, play in that area, right? Um, exactly. Which is great because it's providing you know, it's, it's bringing it to them. Um, but the majority outside of the opportunity zone, you know, these workforce uh, locations or where they can get rent and afford it, et cetera, um, are outside the city, you know, and that's what they have to do. And that's one of the big challenges. And if they can, um, you know, bring that closer in, that's great. Now, some of the issues that you run up with is it, we talked about zoning, right? So that's something that needs to be identified. Um, you know, you have what's called NIMBYs, not in my backyard, 
So you'll get people that are like, okay, yeah, this is great. It's going to help the area, but I'm for it until it's in my backyard. And I'm worried that, you know, there's going to be a problem. It goes back to where a lot of people think it's subsidized rather than hardworking people that are working multiple jobs, et cetera. Right. So, um, but that's a true, you know, that that's a legitimate um, uh, concern that a lot of people have. Now, the other ones too is, is, you know, that they thought about um, using is actually uh, not only the OZs like we've been talking about, but um, some municipalities about it creating a dedicated housing uh, trust fund, um, repurs- repurposing vacant land, right? Under, underutilized retail space, um, having certain inclusive zoning. Um, have any know, of these, have, DJ, have any of these other strategies worked? I mean, I think the Opportunity Zones program, I would say to a, a, a good extent, but maybe a limited extent, it has worked. I mean, we've seen tremendous multifamily assets get built, you know, ground up development, um, with with successful outcomes for the investors, but some of these other strategies that you've mentioned, have they actually you know been successful in helping bridge the gap? You know, they've also um, what what they've done in the past, right? They came out with low income housing tax credits, which is an incentive to build, and you're getting money from the government to help subsidize the development. Um, you know, there's certain guidelines that you have to move around. And you got to jump through hoops, but there are developers that focus on that. The returns for investors are much lower, but there is additional monies that happen. You also have uh, new market tax credits where you can actually, once again, have money that is government subsidized to help building these. So they've continued to try to figure out solutions in order for this to happen. Um, in my mind, the OZ is probably one of the best that they've done. But I think ultimately, you know, it's going to come down to zoning. Will they accept it? Will they not? You know, there's a um, up here in Colorado in a town called Greeley. It's between Fort Collins and Denver. And going through those zoning uh, requirements, you know, their zoning laws, they literally said that they will allow for, uh, you know, mobile home communities or, or similar modular uh, to rent communities and they welcome it. Right. And, and, and these communities have changed a ton over the past where, and, and are they, sorry, are they actually living up to that? I mean, a lot of, cause a lot of localities will say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like San Francisco or something that's just a poster child of saying we're really focused on this issue but then their actual policies fly in the face. So is this town actually, you know, are they putting their money where their mouth is? Are they actually allowing well, it the, in terms of zoning? The, the short answer is yes. But the biggest difference between a San Francisco, like you mentioned in Greeley, if you were to pull it up on a, a Google um, uh, you know, map and you looked from the or a satellite picture, there is so much land. It's not landlocked. It's not <laughs> landlocked it's, by a is, body of water. It was all, it was all, well, it's also like all this farmland and everything yeah. else. So there is so much land. They see that as tax dollars to help with their community. So they're open for everything. Right. Well, that sounds like Houston with, you know, Sugarland and all these yes. suburbs that are pretty much large yeah. cities in their own right. That's right. But you, when they start, they're just small. Right. And so when they're small, the, the town city will say, oh, how do we grow this? Right. So it'll get to a point at some point in time that they'll say, OK, we're cutting this off. But as of right now, they are open to it. The thing is, is a lot of people, the majority of people don't under, don't know that that is actually written in their bylaws um, until today after, you know, all your people watch, watch this. Um, but it's, um, you know, that's that's. Um, that's what's needed to really it's not it's not incentives uh from the government it's it's uh allowing for these communities you know so it's sim- not, you- not not necessarily that you need the incentive you simply need the the legal legal permission the legal the legal ability to develop that's really 
the bottom line when you kind of cut through the subterfuge and red tape and all all the programs yeah. is the bottom line is can am I legally allowed to build or not right it is and I, and I'll uh, you know like I said I mean it's much different than what people realize in fact when I was in in Boston I took on a um, just a three month contract and it was a group called Hometown America so they said okay you know come in there's two different properties that they had and help us figure out what's going on, right? Because it would take them like a year in order to provide a, a request that came in from one of the people that lived there. And they had two properties. The first one was a mobile home park, uh, which is what you think of, right? Garbage everywhere, cars around, you know, which, which is a stereotype. Mm -hmm. The other one I went to was a 55 and older. And they had landscaping everywhere. They had a clubhouse. They had a pool. They had, you know, their homes were, were you know, modular. But when you walked in, you would never know in a million years that they, uh, that they were built like that, right? Sure. And their classification. Um, and, and those are communities that can really be built um, that you're not going to notice and help with this affordability perspective you're gonna to have to have smaller homes but once again and, and DJ, those are you know modular homes are like an order of magnitude more affordable right they i are, mean it's uh, significantly in fact when during the time and this was probably about 20 15 years ago a home on average cost 160,000. well in the rest of massachusetts it was like 450. Mm -hmm. so it's considerable but but once again they were far away from the city center, right? Mm. They had to be far out. And, you know, I, there's a perception problem. That's why you have these people that are saying not in my backyard. And it. It, it's, it's more of an education and awareness, you mm. know, and, and that's why people that are looking at opportunities, you really need to take a hard look at this and understand who are the tenants because they're not subsidized, right? These are hardworking people, police officers, firemen, you know, people that are managers of retail locations. I mean, these are these are people that are, um, you know, they're they're hardworking and they just want a place to say that they can afford, and that's nice. A absolutely. I mean, if you if you're hardworking at a job that's adding value to society, it's it's not too much to ask that you have a roof over your head that's clean and safe and in a neighborhood, you know, with, with families and other amenities. So let, let's um, switch gears for a minute because you'd sent me some notes uh, and specifically this case study of Breckenridge, Colorado. Yep. And so there are, you know, you already mentioned um, another, I believe town in Colorado, but so some localities um, you know, number one, I guess they quote unquote, get it, but, but number two, Politically, policy-wise, however, they've been able to get their act together and actually, you know, um, enact the policies that allow for the development of a substantial amount of workforce housing. And obviously, it differs from locality to locality. So, mm -hmm. what happened with Breckenridge, and what kind of effects did they see when they allowed for the development of workforce housing? Yeah. And, and, you know, what they did is that, and there's a lot of cities and towns that are looking at the impact mm -hmm. of affordable workforce housing, right? On the community, the demographics, economies, housing prices, you know, what are the options? And which is really uh, great, right? Because when you have data, you can make better decisions rather than just making assumptions of, oh, this isn't good, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the town of Breckenridge did um, the, some of the reasons for promoting this affordable and below market priced housing, specifically in resort communities, right? They range from a number of things. So it's boosting the resident base, increasing household diversity, right? To build and maintain a sense of community. When you're looking at these resort communities, a lot of people just come in during the winter. Right. That's where the for the scheme that happens a lot in this type of thing. Also to uh, housing essential workers, um, health care, emergency services, uh, education. So it can improve the quality of of uh, they wanted to see if it would improve the quality of services um, to residents and the visitors. Uh, they wanted to because they are seasonal. They wanted to see if this would decrease 
the seasonal fluctuations in the local economy by providing local resident base that can support the local businesses throughout the year, right? Because a lot of people are just there. They, it's boom or bust. And, right. and if they had zero snow, they, they have big problems. Uh, and also improving employee satisfaction, right? Decreasing job turnover, reducing commutes by allowing the workers to reside in or near the community in which they work. So these were, um, you know, s- the reasons that they really wanted to dive into this. And um, it was very interesting because what they found out is that by having affordable housing for the workforce, at least in Breckenridge, that these workforce uh, housing programs can have a significant impact on the demographics, the economy, uh, the housing affordability in in a community, right? So, for example, in, in Breckenridge, you know, as we're talking about, the uh, households that reside in this workforce housing units, they're more likely to have children, uh, be younger on average, uh, have resided in the area less than 10 years um, and report their homes are in better condition than those in the market rate housing. And, um, you know, this was between 2000, 2010. I mean, what, what, one of the reasons that are really driving all of these apartments is because of affordability and not being able to buy them. Right. Right. Now you also have other factors that, you know, maybe they don't want to have their, they don't have children yet, or they don't want to take care of lawns and everything else. Um, but with these loans, student loans is a huge problem, right? How, how are you going to pay those off and still pay for that? So, you know, some of the th- the the results that came out of records just to continue there is that uh, it accounted by having this increase in number of families and children within the town, it actually accounted for 60% of the growth in these households. Um, it helped wow. the town address, uh, you know, second homeowner pressures, uh, increased local occupancy from 25% in 2000 to 28%. So there's, you know, we're starting to see that increase. It significantly helped essential workers purchase homes in town. So the healthcare, emergency services, education, mm-hmm. child care, uh, decreased community. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, a couple of these things, DJ, you're mentioning, you know, think of like a, a teacher shor- shortage or yeah. a, a nursing or healthcare worker shortage. Well, you're going to need workforce housing. You're going to need, you know, middle class, working class housing in your community, or you can expect a shortage of those type of workers. And then the other interesting thing you mentioned demographics, and I'm thinking of, you know, luxury, you know, class A multifamily, or just in general luxury housing in generally. You know, who, who's that going to be generally? It's going to be older people and that more advanced. Yeah stage of their career who can afford those types of homes. Whereas, you know, young, young families uh, with children, you know, they're more likely to be in the earlier stages of their career where they're still starting to build up personal wealth. You, you know, yes. And they also have more disposable income, right? Mm-hmm. So the, this increase that they had, um, because remember, they were going to a year around. They wanted more people year round. I mean, it increases expenditures by fifteen million per year. I mean, that's a that's a lot of money in that local economy, right? right. And then when you look on the the housing options, it, it provided a variety of housing um, for the locals and um, the price points. And and overall, they actually uh, the housing held their value better during the housing recession, and were much less susceptible to foreclosure. Uh, than market rate units. And so, you know, that's a pretty big impact as a whole. Now, who benefits from that as well? Well, obviously, these people that are working there does. But the other people that you just mentioned, if they're older, or if they have second homes, or, Mm -hmm. you know, if they live there permanently, you know, um, you know, our the academic director at the Family Office Real Estate Institute, you mentioned earlier, uh, Glenn Mueller is a professor at the University of Denver. He lives out, right outside of Breckenridge and um, he benefits because of the vitality, right? And sure. when you have more people, then you got to have a gro- you know, more grocery stores. Well, now that helps the, the other residents and stuff like that. So it, it, it's, it's uh, sort of like the opportunity zones where it can feed off, off of each other. A virtuous cycle. And I, absolutely, you're right. It, the, even the wealthiest resident of any given census track or MSA, 
they're going to benefit from more teachers, uh, you know, firefighters, police officers living in that local area. That's going to improve a community. Families living in the local area. Uh, everybody needs to go to the doctor now and then, right? So when you go to the doctor, no matter what your income, you don't want there to be a, a nursing shortage when you go to the yeah. doctor, right? So you're absolutely right. It, it does benefit everyone. Well, also so the quality, the quality of doctor, right? Because if yeah. you have a doctor that can have a thriving practice, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, rather than just occasionally make money, you're going to get even better doctors and stuff like that, right? And it'll sort of feed upon it. I mean, you know, th this topic, Andy, this is a huge need that needs to be addressed. And it depends how the local municipalities look at it, just like we said, Greeley. Mm -hmm. um, I think the opportunity zones are helping with that. Um, it depends on how the government really looks at this. I, I, I think that it depends what parties in the government, too. I think that it depends whether it's a Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty obvious that the Democrats are, are more for figuring this out. Um, but also, you know, at the end of the day, and I've said this by the project we have in Houston where there is no zoning, I said, if somebody can figure out how to take that same model, work around some of these zoning issues, um, it's huge. It's, it's a game changer because a solution is needed. A yeah, solution ab is really absolutely. Needed. And, it, and, you know, the, the intent, I would say the intent is not enough. You know, no. so so you mentioned, you know, younger people with ideals that want this problem solved. The intention is not enough if if the proposed policy solution is actually counterproductive, like as is the case with rent control. The intent is not enough. You need the actual solution that can exist in a market based reality in the real world. So that that being said, what do you think is the future of of workforce housing? I mean, nationwide, are there any are there any trends that you would identify? I know it kind of differs locality by locality, but I'm looking for big, broad trends. Yeah, I mean, it's becoming um, it's becoming more and more discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you really heard much about it going, you know, probably five, six years ago. It wasn't discussed as much. So the awareness is increasing, uh, which is good. And mm -hmm. that is being in addition to uh, the multifamily demand which there's still a lot of fundamentals that are there driving what's happening in that market. Um, you know, I, I think that from what we've seen with the OZ and whatnot, that there's, there's strides in this direction. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, whether it's Texas or, or the government figures out how this can be built anywhere, maybe at a certain level, but built, well, not only will it solve the problem for the demand that's there, because once again, there's a $7 million or a 7 million unit demand. Um, and when I say unit, I mean where people, somebody would live in. Sure. Um, but with that also comes developers that'll be willing to build, mm -hmm. which will help solve the problem. Investors that'll be willing to invest because they'll get really nice returns, which helps solve the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And so- um, I would say to anybody watching this is that when there's a workforce housing opportunity that comes across your desk or whatnot, you really need to take a hard look at that because there's such a demand and there's such an opportunity. Well, and the DJ, more that, so DJ, let's say that does come across my desk, you know, an, mm -hmm. an offering um, with workforce housing. What are, what are like the key two or three things, you know, aside from all the normal due diligence, that's always important. What are the key things that you really look for, you know, in, in your role at Evergreen or with, you know, with the families that you work with, what are the key factors that you're really looking for? That's a good question. We always focus on the sponsor, the operator first. Mm -hmm. Can they implement? Have they done something like this before? Do they have experience? Because it doesn't matter how great of an idea, regardless of the real estate opportunity, if that group cannot implement. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one thing. And that's any real estate investment. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I'd look at to say, okay, is the demand there? Is there such? Now we know that there's a huge demand, but in that specific location, is it showing a demand, mm -hmm. right? 
because somebody could there are parts of the country that there might not be those types of workers you know for right. for whatever reason or not as many as workers so i'd look at the area to say okay is this um how much of that demand are we actually filling that's the other thing the third thing i would look at and this is really um you know this is outside of any um uh of any metrics you can look at or anything is would I want to live in a community like that? Or could I see people living there? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if, if you saw something and say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't live there. Right. Um, it's probably other people are going to, you know, <laughs> feel the same way. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that is the best test. I, I want I, like in software programming, I think the phrase is something like you have to eat your own dog food, meaning you got to use your own software. If you're not even willing to use your own software, it must not be very good software. So yeah, I, I hundred percent degree from that standpoint of, of real estate investment and multifamily investment, workforce housing investment. So this is the stage of the show. I know we're running long, um, short on time here where I normally, you know, ask, you know, where can our visitors learn more about evergreen property partners? But I did want to mention that we are, planning uh, a webinar, an upcoming webinar. And I think this episode is going to air a couple days, maybe about a week before that webinar. So if you're listening or watching this episode, make sure to check our show notes because we'll have more information in the show notes. But that being said, DJ, where can our viewers and listeners go to learn more about Evergreen Property Partners? Yeah. And one thing I just want to mention too, is that in investors a lot of investors want cash flow, and, and because of the demand, a lot of um, of these types of communities or um, housing needs to be developed, right? It, it just because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But usually, there's there's going to be some very strong cash flow coming around the corner. So don't let that um, persuade you, right, from looking into this because from a long term investment, it, it'll be extremely uh, strong. Um, second thing too, is when we do, um, have that webinar that we're talking about, uh, if you listened and got, got this far, you'll see how, what we're working on falls in line with what we've spoken about, right? So you'll be actually having an actual example of everything we've spoken and how it's being utilized in a practical purpose from an investment standpoint. Uh, you can find us at evergreenpropertypartners.com big, long uh, uh, URL, but it's pretty simple. So uh, evergreenpropertypartners.com. Uh, if you have any questions, all you do is put it DJ at evergreenpropertypartners.com as well. So, um, but this is, um, thank you so much, Andy. This is great because it's uh, a lot of people don't really understand the ins and outs of workforce housing. And I think that it's education like this that can actually help um, uh, you know, not only investors, but, uh, the future demands. Absolutely. And DJ, just kind of a side note, I don't think I've ever told you, I really love the evergreen brand name and website and everything. Just the, the concept of evergreen, uh, really jives with like the family office philosophy of preserving wealth and, you know, the evergreen nature of that. Well, thank you very much. I, we, we appreciate it. We, um, we plan on, on um, you know, utilizing various uh, verticals to, to continue that, that theme as well. Excellent. DJ, thanks so much for joining the show today. Well, thanks for having me.